We'll get started in just a moment. Hello and welcome. I'm Marsha Mott, the Health Promotions Coordinator for UF Health. Today we're talking about Parkinson's disease and we have two great speakers for you. Our first speaker is Dr. Ashley Rawls. Dr. Rawls earned her bachelor's degree in biology from Duke University and a master's degree in aging and neuroscience from the University of South Florida. She went on to receive a medical degree from the University of Florida in 2014. After medical school, she completed her neurology residency at the University of South Carolina Medical School. She then pursued a clinical movement disorders fellowship and a postdoctoral research fellowship at Stanford University. Dr. Rawls is board certified in neurology by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. In addition to being the chief resident in neurology at the Medical University of South Carolina, Dr. Rawls has also been recognized for her diversity and inclusion advocacy, such as serving on the Stanford University Department of Neurology Diversity and Inclusion Committee and the Stanford Leadership Education in Advancing Diversity Scholar in 2019. Our second speaker is Heather Simpson. Heather received a master's in occupational therapy in 2009 from the University of Florida. She went on to complete a doctorate from the University of St. Augustine for Health Sciences in 2017. She's cared for patients in a variety of settings, including outpatient neurology, inpatient physical rehabilitation, and pediatric rehab. Heather provides occupational therapy evaluation and treatment for patients with movement disorders, including Parkinson's, Parkinsonisms, dystonia, essential tremor, ataxia, muscular dystrophy, and Tourette or Tic syndrome. Heather has extensive sensory integration training and arousal modulation training related to movement disorders. Heather has received specialized training for LSVT big and comprehensive behavioral intervention for tics, which is also known as CBIT. Both of our speakers care for patients at the UF Center for Movement Disorders and Neuro Restoration. The center was, was created in 2002 and remains one of the most vibrant, most collaborative and most rapidly growing centers at the McKnight Brain Institute. Since the launch of the center, the growth has had the growth has been exponential. It now forms the core of the Norman Fixell Institute for Neurological Diseases, which is located in Gainesville off Southwest Williston Road. If you have any questions for our speakers today, please feel free to submit your question by using the Q&A icon or button at the bottom of your screen. We have a large audience today, and I know we're going to have a lot of great questions, so I'm going to do my best to get to all of them. Keep in mind that we can't provide medical advice, so if you have specific questions about medical treatments you're receiving or medications, you should consult your physician or pharmacist about those. Today's webinar is recorded, and a link will be posted on ufhealth.org slash wellness, as well as we'll send it out in a follow-up email if you want to watch this presentation again or maybe share it with a friend. Thank you so much for attending. Dr. Rawls, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marsha. Hello, my name is Dr. Ashley Rawls. Uh, I am one of the movement disorder specialists here at the uh, University of Florida uh, Norman, Norman Fixell Institute. Can everyone hear me and see me well? Yep, it's great. Okay, excellent. All right, so give me a moment. Uh, I'm going to pull up our PowerPoint that we have for you today, and I'm going to start <clears throat> in just a second. Okay. Let me share my screen. Okay. One moment, please. Oh, excuse me, I have to move it back again. Okay. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yep, we see your screen just fine. Excellent, give me one second. I'm just gonna drink a bit of water. Please excuse me, I just had a bit of a dry throat. Okay, welcome to our webinar. My name is Dr. Ashley Rawls, and I'll be talking about some facts about Parkinson's disease, um, doing some troubleshooting, the medications that we use, uh, surgical options, and the like. Give me one. 
excuse me, a bit of a frog in my throat. Okay, so we'll start with a little bit of background here. So what is Parkinson's disease? So it is a neurodegenerative disorder that has several motor and non-motor features. Um, when we talk about neurodegenerative diseases, this means that um, over time, the symptoms will progress. Um, there's a worldwide prevalence of Parkinson's disease of about 0.3% in the general population of persons age 40 and older. There's about five to 35 new cases out of 100,000 people globally per year. Um, so this is something that is, is, is seen around the world and that people have to end up um, addressing with them and also their loved ones. So um, things that are associated with an increased risk of Parkinson's disease are going to be older age and also a uh, family history of a person that has Parkinson's disease. Uh, sometimes there can be environmental factors as well um, that people have found in their studies that can increase your risk of developing Parkinson's disease. One of them is going to be uh, pesticide exposure. Uh, people may have heard uh, uh, rotenone in the Central Valley of California. Um, some of our uh, patients who have a job as a migrant worker, they've been found to have an increased risk of Parkinson's disease-like symptoms that we believe are excuse me, associated with that pesticide, uh, which has since been not in use. Um, other things can be as well a history of traumatic brain injury, living in a rural area, and well water um, has been found in some of the studies to be associated uh, with a development of Parkinson's disease. So the majority of Parkinson's disease um, diagnoses are sporadic. However, our patients who end up being diagnosed with Parkinson's disease who are younger than the age of 50, um, sometimes there can be a genetic cause that could be um, increasing the risk for having uh, symptoms of this disease. Um, currently, there are no disease modifying agents available yet for Parkinson's disease. Um, therefore, genetic testing really is not recommended for routine clinical practice. But if there is a younger person who has a young onset Parkinson's disease below the age of 50, some people may consider getting genetic testing to help um, evaluate to see if there's a genetic component that could be involved with their uh, clinical manifestation. So when we talk about Parkinson's disease, there are four main motor symptoms that people often look for that may be seen by uh, their primary care provider or their caregivers or even themselves. Uh, one of them is going to be resting tremor. This is a tremor when someone um, ha is at rest, for example, if their arm is resting on a table or a chair, or if you see the foot on the floor, it can be present in the limbs and uh, mainly, sometimes you can have a little bit um, in the head, there can be some tremor when someone's head is lying back. Um, but the resting tremor is oftentimes one of the uh, main presenting symptoms that uh, myself and other providers like me see in clinic. And those the, usually that's the, the, the uh, sign that brings people into the office. So it doesn't have to necessarily be the, uh, the fingers or the hand itself. It could also involve the leg as well. There's also stiffness of the body that's involved um, and slowness of the body. So those are two other cardinal signs of Parkinson's disease. And so stiffness, we also refer to as rigidity and slowness is what we call bradykinesia. Um, so this can be sometimes difficult to parse stiffness and slowness out um, from arthritis or other musculoskeletal problems that can also present as stiffness and slowness, okay? Uh, poor balance and walking difficulties. So our patients with Parkinson's can have difficulty with um, having slowed shuffling gait, difficulty lifting the feet from the floor. And also there can be an issue with balance, more falls or near falls can occur. And this can be uh, a big issue that, that can also bring people to our clinic. Now, getting just, just touching a little bit kind of on the uh, uh, neurology or pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease, there's a little um, 
uh, a picture that I have on the slide here that talks about a normal neuron that has the appropriate amount of dopamine that's produced in this uh, place in our brain called the substantia nigra, or black substance is also what it means. So this place produces a majority of our dopamine, and then the dopamine uh, gets transferred through our brain to the deep structures in our brain that allow us to move when we want to move and not move when we don't want to move, okay? However, in our patients that have Parkinson's disease, there's the cells that produce the dopamine and the substantia nigra start to die off. Um, and unfortunately, the dopamine that we need to help us move when we want to move or not move when we don't want to move is not um, produced as regularly. And so you, you then end up getting the clinical manifestations of Parkinson's disease. So resting tremor, stiffness of the body, slowness of the body, and balance problems and walking difficulties. Okay. So some early clinical signs of Parkinson's disease, like we spoke about, one of the main things that brings people in that I see is going to be tremor or rhythmic shaking that occurs when a person's arms or legs are at rest, usually beginning on one side and later spreading to the other. Um, sometimes the person who has the shaking of the limb may not notice um, what we would consider a resting tremor, but friends and family members may pick this up and over time, it may involve more of the limb and then potentially spread to the opposite side as well. Uh, usually for our patients with Parkinson's disease, this is asymmetric, meaning it starts on one side or the other. It doesn't really have any uh, obvious uh, correlation to handedness. Like for example, if you're right-handed, you're definitely gonna have more sense on the right side or vice versa. Um, and like I was saying, the tremor can also be in the leg as well. So um, if you're experiencing this or seeing this in a person, be mindful. It doesn't have to always be a handshake. There can also be leg involvement as well. We... Uh, and so, so that usually tremor is something that we can easily see and pick up on exam. Stiffness and slowness just out in the community is a little bit more difficult. Um, many people will describe stiffness and slowness in different ways. For example, difficulty getting into and out of a chair, into and out of a car, turning, uh, particularly in a tight space. Um, there can be some issues with movement of our body that can be an early sign of Parkinson's disease. Walking can be uh, an issue that's affected as well, along with balance. So people can notice decreased arm swing, particularly on one side more than the other, a shuffling gait, meaning that the feet are not, um, there's not very good foot clearance or foot height that occurs in the length between the steps is shortened. Um, and also what we kind of mentioned before, difficulty turning in tight spaces. Some people have what we call in-block turning, meaning that they, they're walking, they need to turn, uh, turn around, and they have several steps that are done as opposed to one or two steps to turn in the opposite direction, okay? There can also be some falls as well, but usually there's not significant falling initially with, the, with uh, Parkinson's disease. There, so those are some early signs of Parkinson's and those are the things that usually get people into the clinic when I see them. However, there can actually be other signs that can occur even a decade before people start having motor symptoms, which, which we would include tremor, stiffness and slowness and uh, walking or balance difficulty. Some people can actually act out their dreams, okay? Uh, feeling their limbs, kicking in bed. Usually the person um, who is acting out their dreams does not know that they're acting out their dreams. Um, however, their spouse or someone else in the home may notice that the person is kicking or they're calling out in a very loud and clear voice. And sometimes the spouse will say, yes, you know, uh, five years ago, I had to move into another room because my loved one was making so much noise and, and unfortunately being disruptive in their sleep. 
Uh, this is actually called REM behavior disorder or REM behavior disorder. So during rapid eye movement, <clears throat> for most people, your body is nice and relaxed and, and paralyzed so you don't act out your dreams. However, our patients with Parkinson's disease that goes awry. So when they have a dream, usually it's them fighting off someone or running away. Um, they will not be loose and relaxed and they'll have their it increased a regular tone. And so they'll be able to move and fight and call out when that would not normally happen. <clears throat> Another early sign, non-motor sign of Parkinson's disease is a decrease or loss of sense of smell. Again, we have to be, diff we have to be, uh, uh, look at the whole picture. If someone has several, a lot of infections of, of, of the nose or a lot of nasal surgeries, that can obviously change your ability to smell. But some of our patients will notice, like I said, even 10 years before, that they're having a loss of sense of smell. And that can be if someone's chopping onions or garlic or there's a baby with a dirty diaper and people don't notice it, or there's a gas leak or there's smoke somewhere that their, their loved one or family members may notice their, this smell, but the person who's affected may not notice it. And that can be something that's hard to kind of quantify because most people, particularly if it doesn't, you know, go away suddenly, don't may not notice that it's not there as strongly. Another one is going to be significant constipation. Again, there are numerous reasons for people to have constipation, whether it's not enough fluid intake or um, the type of foods that are being eaten or, other, or, or medications that are taken to treat other issues. Significant constipation uh, can, uh, can be a sign that maybe the movement, the gut motility is not where it should be. Uh, again, this is not, you know, I have a hard bowel movement once a day. This is more, I'm going two, three, even four days or more without having a bowel movement. And this can be definitely problematic. Another one that can happen can be mood disturbance, particularly anxiety and depression. I find that many of the patients that I see in clinic, if they already had baseline <clears throat> anxiety, that can be worsened as the disease progresses. Or someone who doesn't have the baseline mood disturbance, they can start to develop that and, um, when they weren't like that before. So that's something else that can be linked as an early sign of Parkinson's disease. Now, all of these things uh, are not just, oh, I have a tremor, therefore I have Parkinson's, or oh, I lost my sense of smell, therefore I have Parkinson's. You want to put everything into context with your, with your uh, care provider, whether it's your neurologist or your primary care or whoever you go to that you want to <clears throat> potentially address potential signs that are going on. So you have to put the, the whole thing in a clinical picture to make sure that um, you know, we're ruling out other things that could be contributing to some of these um, abnormalities here. Okay. So when I see patient, people in clinic, um, there's two main, uh, uh, what we call phenotypes or the way these diseases present that I see. Tremor predominant and what we consider akinetic rigid. There is a third phenotype that people uh, think of as postural instability and gait difficulty, but I haven't found um, too much of a difference between that and either of these two. Um, so I, I don't consider that as a, uh, another subtype. So I just stick, stick with these two for my own practice. So my patients that have tremor predominant Parkinson's, this is the classic Parkinson's that you uh, see. There's a lot of shaking, usually on one side and the other. Um, the resting tremor that they have uh, improves when they move and it comes back after a little bit with holding a posture or getting a new resting state. Um, these patients usually um, do not have as much stiffness or slowness when I initially see them early on in the disease process. So most of the time people say, hey, I've got this tremor. I don't really have as much stiffness or slowness or imbalance problems. My main issue is a shaking, which is keeping me from um, doing the things that I want to do or is embarrassing to me in public potentially. Um, Usually over time, the tremor does increase, and then the problems with stiffness and slowness also increase as well as the disease process continues, but most of the time the focus is on, on tremor treatment. Um, 
Our other phenotype or, or subtype that we talk about is akinetic rigid. So these are the people, akinetic, meaning they don't move very well, and then rigid, meaning they're very stiff. So stiffness and slowness are their main presenting symptoms. In tremor, they either don't have that much tremor or it's it, it starts to come up later on in the disease process, but usually does not become as much of an issue as it does for our tremor predominant patients. Um, unfortunately, for these patients um, that are that are more stiff and slow than tremulous, um, many times uh, uh, people are, or uh, providers in the community may not recognize this other kind of subtype of uh, presentation of this disease. So there may be some delay in diagnosis because some people may assume, well, you can only have Parkinson's disease if you have a tremor, which is not necessarily the case. You can be stiff and slow and not have a tremor and still have Parkinson's disease and benefit from the medications and interventions that we have. Um, there's also um, some potential ethnic uh, uh, and racial differences uh, with between the two uh, uh, subtypes that we have here. Our akinetic rigid persons are seen more in certain demographics like in African American and Hispanic populations. Again, there's a kind of a, 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 a caveat or corollary with that is that um, there's not a whole lot that there is, we're trying to increase research in uh, underrepresented, uh, in the underrepresented minority population with these disease, um, with these disease states, but we still are working on gathering more research to make, you know, stronger uh, associations. Okay. So let's move on to medication options. So you guys probably are well aware uh, there are several oral uh, medications, uh, uh, sublingual medications and patch form or transdermal uh, formulation of medications and an inhaled form that can be used to help treat the, um, to treat the uh, problems associated with Parkinson's disease. So I listed in this table uh, the class, side effects, and the generic and brand names of many of these medications. This is not an exhaustive list, and these are all the FDA-approved medications. So there are probably things that um, I'll have to update going forward once things become more FDA-approved, but I'm just going to hit on the basic classes here, and I'm sure that some people have been using some of these uh, medications over time. So our first class is the that many people start out with, uh, which is going to be our dopaminergic medications. Um, I separate these from dopamine agonists because they have different side effect profiles, even though they, their main thing is to basically replete or give back the dopamine that's being lost as the cells in the substantia nigra continue to die. Okay, our first class is dopaminergic. This is going to be our carbidopa, levodopa, or our uh, cinnamet, cinnamet CR, cinnamet ER, which are extended release cinnamet, our percopa, which is our sublingual tablet for carbidopa, levodopa, and dissolved under the tongue, our ritari, which is the combination pill of um, carbidopa and levodopa with short and long acting forms at the same time. Embresia is gonna be our inhaled formulation as well, uh, basically of carbidopa, levodopa. Um, so these are kind of usually our starting blocks for our patients who are in the 60s, 70s, 80s, our patients who are, 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 are older. Um, and these can really be helpful in basing, giving, basically giving back the dopamine that's being lost. Um, there are side effects, these medications, just like everything else. Um, nausea, um, sometimes vomiting can occur, sleepiness, orthostatic hypotension, meaning that when you go from sitting down to standing or lying down to standing, your blood pressure will drop and may feel lightheaded and may have fainting. And also hallucinations as well. Dopamine agonists are going to be basically giving the dopamine directly back in um, through the gut into the brain after taking the pill or the patch, depending on or the patch through the skin, depending on which one you have, um, or the injection. Um, so these are 
I, I find these to be stronger than the dopaminergic medications, but unfortunately they do have significant side effects that limits their use. Um, for me, when I use dopamine agonists on my patients, usually these are patients who are younger, 40s, 50s, 60s, um, because over time they can be uh, difficult to tolerate, but they do work very well. Um, they can give people that oomph that they need, and there's also longer acting formulations of them as well. Um, this is also the apomorphine, which are the injectable like apokin or kinmobi. Uh, bromocryptine, we usually don't use parladel. Um, it's a little bit of an antiquated drug. Uh, Premipexol or mirapex, ropinerol or requip, and rotigotine or the nupro patch. Um, side effects for these include nausea, sleepiness, again, orthostatic hypotension, hallucinations, and they also have, I see there's it's written here twice, they also have one big thing for them is going to be impulse control disorders. So sometimes our patients who take dopamine agonists, because dopamine is also part of the reward circuit of the brain, can become more impulsive and do things they normally wouldn't do, like buy 200 bird feeders when they normally would not do something like that. So all of my patients who are on this medication, I discuss with them thoroughly about impulse control disorders, and I ask their caregivers or spouse or who's with them to be mindful because the person taking the medication may not know that this could be contributing to their impulsiveness. Another thing as well are sleep attacks. Sometimes uh, with a dopamine agonist, people can just fall asleep suddenly, um, which can be problematic if they're driving or if they're trying to operate heavy machinery or things along that, that line. So you wanna be careful using these medications and go up slowly. Um, there are other medications here as well. There's the anticholinergic class. Uh, these are medications I don't use as much in clinic, but can. They can be very helpful with tremor. Um, unfortunately, there are side effects that people reach before you can get to maximum dose. So there's cogentin or benzerpine and artane or trihexyphenidyl. These medications unfortunately dry you out. Dry eyes, dry mouth, difficulty urinating, constipation, funny heart rhythms or cardiac arrhythmias, hallucinations, memory impairment, and depression, okay? Again, I wanna preface this is just because the side effects are here doesn't mean that you will get every single one of these side effects uh, with these medications, but just be mindful that to look out for certain side effects. There's amantadine, which kind of stays in the category uh, on its own, Symmetrel or Gocovery, which is the longer acting form. This medication uh, I normally use for people who have significant tremor issues. And then also our patients that have dyskinesias or actually wiggly movements that can occur when there's too much dopamine on board from the medications that you're taking. Again, dry eyes, dry mouth, some dizziness, some sleepiness, uh, constipation and hallucinations can occur. There are other helpers here. I'm not gonna spend too much time because I wanna make sure we have time for questions. The COM-T inhibitors and MAO inhibitors, they can help extend the action of the, um, usually the dopaminergic medications that you would take. So you may take Cinemet or Ritari, actually it's not Ritari, you take the Cinemet um, and then you would add uh, one of these um, COM-T inhibitors or MAO inhibitors to make to keep the dopamine from being broken down so we can, and so that the, the mechanism can last longer. And that's Comtan, we don't use Tasmar. Oh, Ongentis is a newer medication, Azelec, Zadago, and then uh, Eldapril or Zelopar. The uh, newer medication that we have that's been FDA approved is going to be Nuriance, which falls in our adenosine receptor antagonist. This can also be helpful for the off times that people experience to extend the action of the dopaminergic medications. Um, some side effects, those nausea, dizziness, constipation, hallucinations, and difficulty sleeping. Now, uh, you guys have probably seen that I have added exercise to the medication options. It seems very strange and out of place, but I tell all of my patients, um, you treat exercise just like you take your medications. You should be doing some sort of exercise um, each day to keep yourself limber 
And also it's, it's been found that exercise is one of the few things, is the one thing that can actually slow down disease progression for Parkinson's disease. I'm not talking about running up Mount Kilimanjaro or swimming the English Channel, but doing something each day, and if not each day, then three or four times a week that can help with um, not just strengthening your core, but also increasing your, your, your cardiovascular health as well. Um, and that'll be discussed in a later slide. So I just want to touch base uh, briefly on troubleshooting. So I'm sure that many people have run into some issues with managing some symptoms associated with Parkinson's disease. Uh, one of them is going to be off symptoms. So many people notice that they take their medication and as you further uh, go in your disease process, the medication wears off and the uh, symptoms associated with Parkinson's disease come back. Stiffness of the body, slowness of the body resting tremor, okay? So things that you can discuss with your provider, potentially if you're having these off symptoms are you could increase the amount of anti-Parkinsonian medications you're taking, decrease the interval between the medications, have longer acting release formulations, and then review your medications to make sure this is optimal for you. On the other side of the spectrum, there's dyskinesias. These are extra wiggly movements that occur that can happen when the medication is working too well. Um, so what can happen is uh, you take your medication and then sometimes you can get extra movements that may not be bothersome to you or stop you from doing what you're doing. If that's the case, many people just monitor them. But if they're painful or they're annoying or they're embarrassing, you can discuss with your provider about potentially decreasing the, the dopaminergic anti-Parkinsonian medication, looking for longer release forms and or trying amantadine to try to offset that issue. Now, nausea, particularly for carbidopa levodopa, um, the medication, the dopamine itself in your stomach can make you nauseous. And so and feel queasy after taking the medication. You can try to take the medication with a small amount of fruit or cat uh, or crackers. Some people will add carbidopa to each of their uh, uh, dopaminergic medication dose, like they'll have carbidopa, levodopa, or cinnamon, and add more carbidopa to keep you from getting nauseous. Um, of note, carbidopa is, is usually not covered as much by insurance and can be pretty pricey, so some people don't use that. And then some people can try a longer release formulation that can be helpful. Another one is orthostatic hypotension. We touched on this before, but going from laying down to standing or sitting to standing up, unfortunately, the regulatory mechanism in our body doesn't work as well. So people can get lightheaded or even fall after standing, even if it's been a minute or two or three after they've gotten up. So things that can help with this are increasing free water intake, compression stockings, salty food with meals, and reviewing medications. Again, make sure you talk to your, um, whoever, if you're your primary care or your, out, or your neurologist about this issue, because you want to make sure that you don't have other factors going on, like fire or high blood pressure that, or, or, or higher blood pressure at other times that can cause an issue. Another thing that people ask me about is going to be sialuria or excessive drooling. This can happen because your, um, your swallowing mechanism that normally occurs naturally without you thinking about it is not occurring as readily. So people can notice drooling that can uh, just be at the corners or even increase and go down on, on their shirt uh, and their chest. What you can do to help with um, uh, increasing the amount of swallowing or ability to swallow throughout the day is chewing sugar-free candy or gum while you're awake. Um, there are oral medications that can decre decrease saliva production. And barring that, you could use botulinum toxin or Botox injections into the salivary glands that can help dry up the amount of saliva that's being produced. Okay. I just want to touch very briefly on the on the uh, FDA approved surgical options that we have for uh, advanced therapies for a Parkinson's disease. Usually we look for surgical options when someone has significant side effects from the oral, um, for, from the non-surgical medications that they would use. Uh, we consider them when people have significant motor fluctuations throughout the day that just aren't optimized with medical management. So there's three main things that we talk about. One of them is, du is duopa or duodopa over in the UK. It's basically a pump 
with a tube that goes into the stomach and it delivers a dopamine gel over time that you can titrate with this uh, pump. Uh, so the pros are there's no penetration of the skull and it's adjustable over time with the amount of dopamine infused. However, it requires an external device of the pump and the tube itself. The pump is a little unwieldy. I may be honest, a little bit smaller than a tissue box, box and it can be um, dislocated. The tube can be dislocated or blocked, okay? But for someone, for some reason, who does not want to undergo um, a surgical intervention, um, that, that could be an option. There's MRI-guided focused ultrasound. So basically, we use ultrasound waves to create a scar deep in the brain and the structures that contribute to tremor and dyskinesia. So basically, you um, sit in an MRI, they put this uh, helmet on your head, and they use focused ultrasound beams to burn a scar deep in the brain to help uh, decrease or even stop tremor. Now, the pros of this are that there's no surgical penetration of the skull and there's no device left in the body. However, it's currently only FDA approved um, for one side only. And if you have a side effect from the scar itself, um, the, the, the side effect could persist long-term. Deep brain stimulation or DBS um, is a neurosurgical procedure where they, it's basically a pacemaker for a brain, for your brain. They put a battery in your chest, a connector and a wire down deep in your brain to help modify the abnormal signal that's causing people to have tremor, stiffness and slowness. So the pros of this is that it can be performed on both sides and it's adjustable over time as disease increases. Cons though, is that requires neurosurgical intervention and there's an external device that's left in the body um, so with all the risks that come with that. So those are things that you, that you could discuss with your neurologist um, or be referred to a large academic center who may have more insight into things of this, uh, of this nature. So uh, I'm actually going to hand it over to Heather. He's going to talk about rehabilitation and Parkinson's disease. Thank you, Dr. Rawls, and um, thank you all for being here. Super excited to talk about um, exercise and rehab in regards to Parkinson's, as Dr. Rawls has set us up very nicely for that, that big prescription on exercise being medicine. And, and we, we talk about it in a lot of diagnoses, but here in Parkinson's, it's really critical. And so I want to introduce you, kind of, I um, want to break some of the stereotypes on what rehab looks like with Parkinson's. So Dr. Rawls, if you will um, hit on the next slide, that would be great. Next slide, please. There it is. So at, at the Fixell Institute, um, we briefly mentioned that we have a large team working together. So um, at our institute, um, on one side of the clinic, we have neurology, neurosurgeons, social workers, um, geneticists, uh, nutritionists. And then on the other side, we have occupational, physical, and speech language pathology therapists. Um, our doctors fully believe, um, based on the research and anecdotal experience, that um, the earlier someone with a diagnosis of Parkinson's receives rehabilitative care, um, the better uh, quality of life and the slower progression of care they get. So um, we're really grateful. Uh, I'm grateful as an occupational therapist, but we are grateful to be involved in such a team approach um, and a multidisciplinary approach. Next slide, please. So what is occupational therapy? Um, I get this question a lot, um, especially most of the time, as we know, um, Parkinson's tends to affect um, middle age adults or older adults. And so I get the question on, hey, you know, I'm retired, I don't need to work. Um, my job as an occupational therapist is not to get you a job. What I consider occupations are, occupations are things that occupy your day. So my, um, I'm looking at dressing, bathing, grooming, toileting, driving, handwriting, spending time with your grandkids, essentially anything that is important to you. So occupational therapy, our goal is to restore and improve performance in those daily occupations or those daily activities to ensure that you have an independent and satisfying life. And what we know since Parkinson's progresses over time, we might not, occupational therapy might not be heavily involved, but as the disease progresses over time, so we step in more because we wanna make sure that you stay independent as long as possible. 
And our goal is to develop or maintain the capacity to perform and uh, satisfaction in the roles that are important to you. So it may not be important to other people, but the roles that are important to you. We want to maintain who you are throughout the disease progression. Next slide, please. So what do we do? We develop routine for activity. Um, maybe you can't play golf in the way that you want to, but how do we help you maintain that role? Or maybe it is, maybe you're not able to drive, but how can we still get you from place to place? Uh, maybe you're not able, maybe your handwriting has changed so much. Um, how can we get you to still pay the bills and still help you um, write those cards to your grandkids? So that is how we intervene in occupational therapy. We also look at managing fatigue, uh, some of the mood, the stress, uh, cognition, so the ability to remember appointments, uh, multitask, dealing with sleep, as Dr. Rawls mentioned, and some of the visual changes, so difficulty with depth perception, uh, clarity, visual, uh, visual contrast. We use a lot of adaptive techniques, so adaptive tools, a lot of uh, modifications, a lot of manipulating things in order to make sure it works um, with trimmers or without trimmers. And then we also work on creating an exercise routine, oftentimes for arms and hands and then those fingers, because those fingers become really stiff and rigid. And so we like to work on those fingers so that they can stay dexterous. Next slide, please. So what is physical therapy? Physical therapy is pretty common, but what does it mean in the, the context of, of a neurodegenerative disorder like Parkinson's? So physical therapists are movement experts, and the goal is to improve quality through exercise, hands-on care, and patient education. So um, Parkinson's disease, the goal is to maintain independence, promote physical activities, and patients leading active lives. So again, it's looking at how can we make sure that you're not wheelchair bound? How can we make sure that you are able to walk as much as you want to? How can you go to Disney World if you want to? How can you, how can you transfer on and off of your toilet? How can you roll in and out of your bed? How can you not get tired um, you know, working around your house? How can you make sure you don't have pain? So Dr. Rawls mentioned that uh, stiffness can be a part of Parkinson's or dystonia where those muscle cramps occur. And so physical therapy can address those things. Next slide, please. So within physical therapy intervention, there is a lot of exercise program, as I had mentioned as well. So stretching, 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 um, range of motion, exercise. Uh, the nice part about exercise within a neuro program, such as Parkinson's rehab, is it tends to be function heavy. So it's not a lot of boring repetitions. If you're having trouble going from sitting to standing, then your exercise is... 10 repetitions of going in and out of your chair or in and out of your recliner every day, right? So it tends to be function heavy, the things that are difficult for you. Balance training, gait training, walking forward, backwards. Uh, we do a lot of boxing in our, our clinic. And so we box, moving back and forth, dual tasking. Uh, Dr. Rawls mentioned kind of freezing of the gates where your feet get stuck or they kind of stutter step through doorways or um, surfaces and helping people uh, manage that so that doesn't occur. A lot of educations helping with managing that orthostatic concerns. Um, and then looking if things such as walkers, canes, uh, or wheelchairs are recommended, they look at that too. Um, also another branch of physical therapy that is not mentioned on here is pelvic health therapy. So motor symptoms like urinary frequency and urgency or constipation can be helped through therapy intervention. Next slide, please. So this treatment scope for PTs and OTs, is, it changes over time, right? So early stages, <coughs> excuse me, early stages might just be getting on a good home exercise program and saying, hey, listen, we know Parkinson's makes you stiff and achy. Let's work on stretching and range of motion and get that going. And then as things kind of progress over time, then we add in balance. Maybe we work on sleep mood changes. And then if we need more, then we jump in and we work on more of those transfers, rolling in and out of bed, working on um, handwriting, maybe working on dressing. Maybe it's working on moving around the kitchen. And so the treatment scope changes over time. Whereas if you were to have um, like a broken wrist, if you were to fall and break a wrist, you have a certain protocol that lasts for a certain amount of time. And neuro rehab with Parkinson's, we're with you throughout your disease progression and we manage and modify our programs according to that, to how your pro disease progresses. Next slide, please. 
Now, um, speech language pathology in the world of Parkinson's um, really looks at kind of two main facets, uh, the management of speech and swallowing problems, which is known as dysarthria, which is the speech difficulties, and dysphagia, which is swallowing difficulties. So limitations in speech um, can lead to difficulties with socialization. So when you have difficulties getting out words or you speak too softly, or um, maybe you have trouble word finding, that can lead to difficulties with communicating with healthcare providers or family, it causes a lot of arguments between spouses, um, which leads to de decreased quality of life and caregiver strain. So what speech language pathologists, they look at how your, your mouth is moving, how your tongue is involved. They look at your voice functioning. So how the quality of your speech is actually going. Uh, they look at the cognitive and language functioning in your brain and how that impacts your speech. And then also they do uh, swallowing and cough function. So at our clinic, we have a, a CR room where we look at swallow studies, you swallow barium, and they actually look at your swallowing mechanism and make sure all those muscles are working um, in a nice smooth rhythm. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, Dr. Ross. There you go, thank you. So within speech uh, intervention, there is behavioral therapy. So changing how um, your motor uh, pattern is. Um, they can do, they can work with ENT to work on Botox. So if you, has, um, you have uh, like dystonia of, your, um, of some of your vocal muscles, they can work with that. They can work on voice amplification, uh, AAC devices, which is alternative augmentative communication. So if you've ever seen people with Dynavoxes or small little computers or iPads where you can touch a button that says, hello, my name is Heather, they work on programming. So even if you lost all ability to speak, they can help you program that. Um, at our clinic, we also do EMST, and what EMST is, it's a cough assist device or a cough, cough training device. So you blow into it, it's set up, it's organized, um, and it's measured by our speech therapist. What you do is you practice it every day, and it strengthens your cough muscles, right? Because if you're able to cough, then you avoid aspiration. You're more likely to avoid aspiration. Maybe you have to modify your diet. If you're choking on your food, maybe you modify your diet, <laughs> and they work on if for some reason you do have difficulty with, with breathing or swallowing, they work on how to make sure you are, are able to maintain a good quality of life um, as needed towards the end of the disease, disease progression. Next slide. And that's the EMSC right there. So uh, next slide, Dr. Rawls. But how do we, how do, we do this, right? So it, if you have Parkinson's for a long time, you don't want to go to therapy every day um, forever, right? You don't want to go three or four times a week. So in therapy, our goal is to minimize impairments and promote strategies, right? So we don't want you to fall. We want you to have safety. We want you to be able to stay at home on your own. We want you to be able to drive. We want you to enjoy life, right? We don't want you to choke. So decreasing aspirations. And as long as we're doing that, we're happy. We want you to live a life that's important and meaningful to you. So in therapy, we, we address those things and then we come up with an individualized exercise program. So next slide, what we recommend in our clinic, um, and you'll see here on this next slide is early intervention, right? We recommend that you come in very, very early. And the reason being is we know that research is really strongly showing that exercise is medicine. Um, so it prevents cardiovascular events, slows osteoporosis, it prevents those mood changes that occur um, with Parkinson's, it can help with increased sleep, which we know imp impacts Parkinson's, it can decrease the fatigue and improve energy, which seems really counterproductive with Parkinson's when you're tired, but the more tired you are and the more you sit, the worse it gets. Um, it can decrease the constipation that comes with Parkinson's, it can improve your motor performance, so your walking, that rigidity becomes better. <clears throat> Minimize the less, loss of muscle loss or mass with age. Um, and there's research to show that the dopamine um, that is lost with um, Parkinson's and that you get with your Parkinson's medicine gets improved. Get more effective use of that um, the more you exercise. And then it improves quality of life. 
so we here at UF um, within our multiple programs that we work closely with, we have boxing programs, we have biking programs, we have dance programs, we have singing programs. We don't care how you exercise as long as you exercise. And we want you to have fun doing it. All right, so next slide, please. So what, what we recommend with our, with our physicians um, who are so great at helping us uh, allow this, Medicare, as of, I believe, 2018 or 2019, has allowed for outpatient therapy, maintenance therapy for uh, progressive conditions such as uh, Parkinson's disease. It used to be that Medicare only allowed 12 to 15 visits per calendar year, but that changed, right? So now what we have recommend with this maintenance therapy, we don't have to have a remarkable large uh, benefit and goals. So we don't have to say, uh, you know, person maintain goals or improved range of motion by 20 degrees. Um, that's not something we have to do anymore because sometimes that's not feasible or patient will no longer use a walker because with a uh, progressive condition that might not always happen. But what we do do is we make goals to say, person will no longer fall. Um, person will be able to stay at home safely on their own, right? Patient will be able to pay their own bills without any concerns. And those are our goals. Um, and Medicare's paying for that. So what we do is when you get a diagnosis, we like to take a baseline measurement. We like to educate you and establish a home program. If you don't need us, great. But we just want to show you how to find the resources. And then every six months, we want to follow up with you. So we take these baseline measurements, we follow up. And the second those numbers change or they become a little bit off that we get concerned, then we reassess and maybe update your home program. Um, and what's nice is because of the maintenance type therapy, what we typically recommend is one time per week, you see OT, PT, and speech uh, for about four to six weeks, so not very long. Then you reduce it to once or twice a month. And so you're seeing OT, PT, speech, you know, once a month or so. You're always having someone um, that you trust having their eyes on you. And then let's say, you know, you're to have a fall or you're a urinary tract infection or something like that, then you come back in. Um, and so you always have someone on your team. You don't have to wait to get in to see the doctor again, um, but you're always um, working with someone and not having a problem solve on your own. Next slide, please. So point of my, my spiel here is inactivity with Parkinson's facilitates degeneration. Um, we are a big advocate. If you stop doing it, you lose it. So that goes from exercise, walking. If you stop dressing yourself, you're going to lose those neural connections. Um, if you stop hanging out with your friends, you're going to lose the ability to socialize and engage in those word finding tasks. So inactivity is the worst thing you can do with Parkinson's. So we want to get you back to those things that you like. Next slide. Um, there are some links here. I'm happy to send them to you. I know Marsha has some of these as well, but uh, there are a lot of resources. If you can't get to our clinic or a therapist, there are some wonderful exercise programs available online. So the Parkinson's Foundation, every Friday is now doing Fitness Fridays where they have an expert in different type of exercises. Come on and give free exercises on YouTube. The APDA chapter in St. Louis has a ton of exercises, one stretching, one's yoga, one's stress management. Um, the power program, the Parkinson's Wellness Recovery has a ton of Parkinson's specific exercises designed at aiming to address the, the rigidity and movements related to Parkinson's. Speak Out program is a program aimed at addressing speech changes with Parkinson's. A lot of free videos online. And then as Marsha mentioned, I am trained in LSVT Big, um, and there's LSVT Big and Loud videos that are available online as well. Next slide. Um, and real quickly, uh, these we're going to have these resources available for you, but we also have these on our Fixel Institute Movement Disorders website. Um, but we are lucky to be recognized as the Center of Excellence, the Parkinson's Foundation who does an incredible job of giving out a ton of free resources in hand version and online version. So 
If you do have a diagnosis of Parkinson's or want more information, please check out parkinsons.org. It's one of many of reputable websites, but this one is, is one of uh, the quickest and easiest to get to. They give you education. They have a resource library of pretty much anything you can think of. They have a lot of events in person. They have a ton of webinars that you could find ranging from nutrition, medication, sleep, uh, sex, driving. Uh, they have all those exercises. They have support group links for your areas. Uh, they have continuing ed courses. So if your physical therapist, occupational therapist doesn't know about Parkinson's, they have free education courses available for them. They have a whole section on caregiver resources and they have, they have a 1-800 um, number that is staffed for hotlines. So if you ever just need support, it's staffed by nurses and social workers and volunteers that can always help you. Next slide, please. Um, if you're new to Parkinson's, they also have on the Parkinson's Foundation uh, YouTube channel, they have a Parkinson's Disease 101 um, kind of channel that goes through kind of what are the different stages, what are the myths, um, when is medication important, and so on. So this is just a great link for you. Next slide, please. Um, these fact sheets are probably the most important ones that I thought were um, would be helpful to someone who's new to Parkinson's. And Marsha is going to link to them in her follow-up with you. Uh, but let's say you have someone that you're concerned might have Parkinson's, but you don't know how to talk to them about it. Um, I have a link there for you. Um, understanding the misconceptions of Parkinson's so that it, it, might, it doesn't always have to be trimmer. Um, how to find a specialist and just basic information about Parkinson's. So these resources will be um, available for you. Um, and easily accessible. Next slide, please. Um, and just to mention, if you are here local um, or even not local, but are able to come up and visit our clinic, we'd love to have you at UF here. Um, we are the UF Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence. We have a team of fabulous neurologists. Um, and as I mentioned, a multidisciplinary team that addresses Parkinson's from multiple perspectives, both motor and non-motor. Um, and so uh, we are happy to help um, in any way, whether it's through support, treatment, care, surgery, rehab, um, we're available for you. So next slide. Um, and then if you are in Alachua County, just to let you know, there are some outreaches um, and you do have a diagnosis of Parkinson's. We do have support groups here. Um, you can attend virtually or in person. I think in person is on, on hold right now, but they are um, uh, available virtually, both a caregiver and uh, uh, a person living with Parkinson's. There are exercise programs, as I mentioned, there's a biking, there's a boxing, there's a dance, there's a general exercise program, um, and, and many more, a singing program, and an arts and medicine program. So there's lots of different programs designed specifically for people with Parkinson's. We have an educational library, so everything you want from the Parkinson's Foundation, if you want it in paper version, we have it. Um, and then we do keep an updated blog um, with things on like how to enjoy the holidays with Parkinson's. We update you on um, new re exercise recommendations and so on and so forth. Um, and you can sign up for our, our movement messenger newsletter if you, if you are interested. Next slide. And then um, we are, we received a community grant from the Parkinson's Foundation to help um, kind of address the disparities in Parkinson's disease against uh, racial diversity. So right now people um, of color, so African-Americans and black Americans are largely underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed uh, with Parkinson's. And so we are hosting three events here in Alachua County, one being this weekend, um, uh, and to discuss about the, the signs of Parkinson's and how to seek care um, if you are um, somebody of uh, racial uh, disparities. Uh, so if you're African-American and um, you want to know more about how it presents differently, how Parkinson's presents differently, um, please join us at our events here. We're, we're going to host three um, in the next few months and we'll have the link for that as well. So next slide. And then I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Rawls again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather, um, for your, your portion of the presentation is very informative. I just wanted to uh, give a little bit of closure with future directions that we have for our patients with with for treatments of Parkinson's disease. 
So um, there is a certain type of deep brain stimulation called closed loop uh, DBS or deep brain stimulation. Um, basically, it uh, there's a device in the DBS that senses the demand of the brain to move or not to move. And then it will give the appropriate amount of uh, competing stimulation deep into the brain through the wire that's implanted so that you don't have to have the DBS on all the time, which is where, which is where, where it is now that's FDA approved. The DBS runs constantly at a fixed settings. Now the settings themselves, we're hoping can use feedback from the brain to change the settings so it can be uh, more of an adaptive device similar to like a pacemaker adapt to the demands of the heart. There's also uh, in research works a uh, subcutaneous levodopa carbidopa infusion. So basically a smaller pump that can infuse dopamine right through the skin or right below the skin subcutaneously um, to maintain a continuous uh, levodopa infusion or dopamine infusion to decrease motor fluctuations. So instead of having to have a surgery or have a tube put in similar to an insulin pump, you could have something that's just right below the skin that can then help with um, delivering the uh, dopamine medication that's needed. All right. Um, I want to open it up back to uh, Mrs. Marsha Mott, who's been helping us with this about questions that we may have. Okay, thank you. Those are great presentations. I really appreciate it. So if you could stop sharing your screen, we'll go ahead and take some of the questions. Um, I received one question that says, um, my husband was recently diagnosed at 63 years old. Um, and after extensive questioning of his quality of life and observing his current tremor, hands and legs, his neurologist says they want to hold off on prescribing medications. Is this kind of a standard practice? Are there any benefits to starting a medication right away versus waiting? Okay. So each and every person is different based on the where they are in their disease process and how it affects the quality of their life. So when I see patients in clinic, I always take that into account as one of the main things for us to start medications. Um, so everything that we do has a side effect, including medications. So you want to be careful about the side effects. And I tell people that if the symptoms, the tremor, stiffness, or slowness, or other non-motor symptoms are not bothering someone, that you can continue to monitor it over time. I tell people, you know, you tell me when you think you're ready. Now, if I see someone in clinic that comes in and they're much further along in their disease process and they're having significant difficulties with their activities of daily living, with feeding themselves, bathing themselves, clothing themselves, getting around, uh, interacting with others, then I may be more, um, more inclined to highly suggest that we start a medication to help ease some of the symptoms that are associated with Parkinson's disease. Okay, good answer, thank you. Um, does the patient diagnosed with Alzheimer's with Parkinsonisms have Parkinson's disease? Um, and are the treatments very different for each other or are they comparable? Okay, so it depends. So some of our patients can have two processes going on at once. You could have Alzheimer's disease, but then also have Parkinson's disease um, that are occurring around the same time. Um, the treatments for Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease are different. So talking with your provider, those can be treated at the same time. Now, some people will have Parkinson's disease and later on um, develop Parkinson's disease dementia, which can be somewhat similar to Alzheimer's disease. So that's a bit of a distinction, um, whether or not uh, someone has classic clinical manifestations and then has a second process like Alzheimer's, or if it's the Parkinson's disease that then has had more neuropsychological, or I should say neuropsychiatric uh, issues along with it that has, you know, progressed from, you know, no thinking problems to mild cognitive impairment to a dementia portion. Um, so it really depends, but if we're, at, if we're asking for that question, if you have Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, they could be two things going on and you can treat them together at the same time. Okay, thank you. So um, I know you mentioned that 
const constipation can be a symptom of Parkinson's disease, but it can, can it also be something that helps identify people who might be more susceptible? Are they connected in that same way? Like if you, a person that experiences constipation, does that mean you're more likely to get uh, Parkinson's? So that's a hard to say. Um, so many of our patients can have non-motor symptoms like constipation that can come 10 years before they have Parkinson's disease, but it doesn't mean that just because you have chronic constipation, it doesn't mean that you will get Parkinson's or that you have Parkinson's. Um, so it's a very complex gut brain interaction that people are kind of figuring out now. Um, so I would say, so it's hard to say whether or not constipation is causing Parkinson's disease, which I think is unlikely. I don't think that that's the current um, uh, theme that we have going, but more as it's a prodromal symptom, meaning that it can be an early sign that this could be occurring. But I wouldn't say if someone comes into my clinic, hey, I have constipation, does that mean I'm going to have Parkinson's disease? I would not I don't think they're at more risk than someone else in the general population. There's also um, many reasons for constipation, like we talked about the fluid intake, what you're actually eating. If for some reason you, for example, someone has diabetes, that can also slow down their, their gut movement as well. If they have other things like Crohn's disease or they have IBS and they, or irritable, irritable bowel syndrome, they flip back and forth between diarrhea and constipation. So there can be many other reasons to have constipation that would that potentially may need to be evaluated, but I wouldn't say that you know constipation means you will get Parkinson's disease. Okay, a uh, good question. How likely am I to inherit Parkinson's disease? My father and sister had it. I'm in my mid sixties. Is there any testing that can be done to help me know if I'm going to have it? So Parkinson's disease is a clinical diagnosis currently. So when you're going to uh, a neurologist or a movement disorder specialist, they can help with your history and your clinical exam and potentially your um, your, your response to medications, if you have clinical findings on exam concerning for Parkinson's disease, can help us with the diagnosis. So gold standard diagnosis for Parkinson's disease is going to be autopsy. Uh, and most people don't get, you know, their brain autopsied after death. So many times we basically focus on the clinical picture. Um, some people have been trying to look for biomarkers and radiology studies and the like. But what I tell people is that, you know, in your family, if there's a, a stronger family history of Parkinson's disease, there may be an increased likelihood that you will at some point develop symptoms of Parkinson's disease, but it doesn't mean 100% that you will get it. OK, um, for for patients that have a higher incidence of Parkinson's disease in their family, I would just be more mindful and cautious of certain symptoms that may occur. For example, early symptoms of tremor or stiffness and slowness, other symptoms of, you know, losing sense of smell, acting out your dreams and, and chronic constipation. Those can be kind of warning signs that may send you to a physician to be evaluated. Um, but if you're not currently having any clinical symptoms that, that you or, or your uh, uh, family or significant or, or loved ones are aware of, then I would just monitor over time. Um, how, someone asked a question, how can I find a doctor's office or a therapist that would specialize in Parkinson's at, in my area? I don't mind answering that. I, um, there is a, there's a nice little link um, on the parkinsons.org website about how to find a, an expert in your area. Oftentimes they, um, and I don't know, Marsha, if I could post it and like type the answer in there or not, or just share it with you, the link to it. Um, but uh, there, there's a, there's a, there's a 1-800 number that likely will try to get you to a center of excellence first, because good role providers, you know, you have the interdisciplinary team approach. Um, and, and um, but there's, there's a nice link that I can either send to Marsha later, um, but it's on the parkinsons.org website. Okay, yeah, I'll probably send that to me because there's no way to put, not like a, a meeting where you can just put it out there for everybody right now, so. Um, we had one question that came in advance of this talk is, what do you think about CBD and its potential use in managing symptoms of Parkinson's disease? Are there research um, trials that are ongoing that someone might participate in? 
Okay. This is a question that I often get in clinic about uh, CBD oil or gummies and whether or not it could help with some of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Um, just like we were talking about, there are still research studies that are ongoing. For myself, I don't you know, prescribe or recommend a CBD oil or gummies or any uh, you know, formulation of CBD for my patients in clinic. However, my patients have, the ones that have done it on their own, have told me that they anecdotally have had maybe some improvement in their anxiety um, and maybe their sleep quality. I, I haven't heard people have told me that it, it's, it's you know, taking their tremor away or made all their stiffness and slowness go away. Um, but if anxiety is um, kind of driving some of the, the shaking and also the, 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 the maybe having difficulty with walking because there's a lot of anxiousness that's keeping us from, you know, moving like we want to potentially in uh, a, a uh, intervention such as that may be helpful. Um, I think it may be helpful as well. If there is a significant anxiety component to either touch base with your primary care provider or psychiatrist um, that can be helpful with prescribing um, other medications, other anti-anxiety or antidepressants that can be helpful. Um, for my patients that, um, so, so clinical trials, we're not currently running one here, I believe with uh, CBD and Parkinson's disease in the Fixel Institute. However, what can be done is there's a website called clinicaltrials.gov that you can uh, put into Google or your search engine. And they basically have a, um, their own uh, webpage with a search engine. You can put in Parkinson's disease and CBD or cannabidiol or what have you, or T, uh, or, and you can put that into the search engine and you can, and there's different um, parameters you can put in and it, it can give you a list of research studies that may be involved with using park involved with CBD and Parkinson. So that's where I would start. We don't have anything currently here that I'm aware of. Okay. So I'm gonna ask the question. I've heard that sometimes tremors kind of ramp up, but then level off over a period of time. In other words, will the progression of the disease remain the same for a, some point in time, maybe even years um, and with no changes? Is that is that common or is that happening? So each person is different. It's, it's a little hard to say, if I may be honest. There are times when, so over time, the dopamine, the cells producing dopamine in the substantia nigra start to die. It's not that they stop dying and then start dying more quickly. It, it seems like it's more of a slow progression of cells becoming lost over time that decreases the dopamine. Now, in that period, when someone has been seeking out clinical care, a lot of times they'll be placed on medications that may be I shouldn't say covering that up, but treating the symptoms until at some point the cells die off to the point where the medications are not um, as helpful. So it may appear that way, um, but I think that over time, it's more of a steady progression. But some people can just have a little bit of tremor and they can just have that small amount of tremor for years. That is very true. And then as the, again, as those cells start to die off, more symptoms and problems happen. And that's when we start to have an increase there. Okay. Um, another question that came in, can you go over a little bit more in depth that the difference between Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonism? Okay. Yes. So part, so Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonism. So Parkinsonism is an umbrella term of which Parkinson's disease is a part of. So Parkinsonism is a constellation of symptoms. So resting tremor, stiffness, and slowness. That includes Parkinsonism. So you need those in order to have Parkinson's disease. Now, I, I, should, I should preface that, that resting tremor is technically really not 100% needed for Parkinson's disease diagnosis, but it would, be, it would be helpful in diagnosing a person if they had a resting tremor. But Parkinsonism can be ca caused by other things. For example, if someone gets a traumatic brain injury, they have a lot of fights kind of like, um, Oh my gosh, what was his name? But um, someone who's a boxer who who has a lot of uh, uh, hits to the brain, sometimes that can give them a Parkinsonism-like picture, but they don't have the the uh, the classic Parkinson's disease like we think of. 
someone who has um, exposure to antipsychotic medications over an extended period of time, like Haldol, Zyprexa, um, uh, Abilify, those can block dopamine. And over time, people can look like they have Parkinson's disease, but they don't actually don't have the same um, the same death of, of, of uh, dopaminergic cells that's supposed to be with the classical Parkinson, Parkinson's disease. So basically it's like saying, for example, um, all German shepherds are dogs, but not all dogs are German shepherds. So Parkinson's disease falls under the umbrella of Parkinsonism, but there are many causes of Parkinsonism of which Parkinson's disease is a part of it. Okay, no, that no helps a lot because I didn't quite understand the answer to that either. So thank you. Um, someone says, um, my father had Parkinson's. He really held off his symptoms for about 15 years with exercise and riding a bike and things like that. Is there any research on genetic modification of genes like the CRISPR gene? Uh, the CRISPR, I know we've been doing some CRISPR trials. I can't remember what for it. Cancer maybe? Um, yes. So right now, from, from, from what I'm aware, there's not obvious modifications that we have, like the CRISPR gene technology to, uh, you know, decrease someone's risk or keep people from developing Parkinson's disease. Again, most of the time when we see people, it's sporadic. Um, there may not be an underlying genetic cause, but we usually don't check um, for genetics in our patients who are older, like 60s and older, which that's kind of the prime age to have these issues. Made, I mean, the, the Parkinson's disease. Maybe in the future, we may be able to use this technology, but I don't think it's available currently today. Okay. Um, let's see. Is there, yeah, at the end of your talk, at the end of your presentation, you talked about like what's on the horizon. Um, if someone has had Parkinson's for a long time and they're kind of further along down the line with symptoms and things like that, are any of these new things that might be happening, are they going to be useful for them? It could be. It depends on what their symptoms are. So each of these interventions have their own risk and benefit. And it depends, for example, if someone is further along in their Parkinson's disease and it's mostly tremor that's the issue and stiffness and slowness and they're thinking uh, or that their cognition is intact, then you could potentially use any of those other interventions, the surgical interventions, like the deep brain simulation, the focus ultrasound, the duopa, um, the, the, the subcutaneous um, infusion, and the, 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 the subtype closed loop DBS. Those can be used, but again, there's a whole lot of factors that go into this, so I can't just say, oh yes, you know, definitely DBS is for you, or focus ultrasound is for you. I think this is something that if you are considering advanced surgical options, then being a evaluated in an academic institution um, that has a multidisciplinary uh, committee that, that houses your neurosurgeons, your neurologists, your therapy services, your psychiatrists, your financial advisors. Those can be helpful in helping determine if you are an appropriate candidate for those more advanced interventions that's further along than the medications. Okay. Heather, I have a question that for you, and one of them is this as people are experiencing therapy or, you know, learning different techniques or strengthening things and learning how to perform their activities of daily living, how is the family involved in that? That's a great question. We, we like the family to be very involved. Um, we consider the care partners um, to be a, a big part of our intervention. So um, depending on what stage of the, the disease progression, uh, care partners might be more involved than than they used to be. Um, and so our caregivers and our care partners are, are equally as important. So a lot of care partner training, a lot of carryover at home, a lot of making sure our care partners are healthy and they're getting the support that they need as well. And so um, we're making sure, it's kind of like that oxygen mask uh, scenario. You can't help others if you're not taking care of yourself first. And so um, care partners are, are heavily involved in our therapy as much as possible. We encourage them to come, whether or not it's every session, but as often as possible. Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad to know that's encouraged there. So um, is there, and I apologize, I'm, I might be butchering this question, but is there any, um, could you talk more about the effectiveness of dopamine? Like once they're started, is it one of those things that takes a while to build up in your system or has a short life and you got to make sure you take it at 9.05 every day? 
Um, could you talk a little bit more about uh, dopamine drugs, um, Dr. Rose? Uh, yes. So it depends on which one that you take and what you're doing when you're taking it. So if we're talking about effectiveness, some and it depends on where the person is in their disease process. So if they are um, further along in their disease process, it stands to reason they may need more dopaminergic medications or more or more or more medications that will help increase their dopamine, either released by the cells that are left over or give them back their dopamine in their body. Um, they may need more of that. So many times, providers like myself, we just start with um, a very general amount to make sure that the person can tolerate it and also that they're not gonna have significant side effects of the medication. And then over time, you can adjust. So I find that my patients that are older that come in with Parkinson's disease, um, I like using the dopaminergic medications, namely Cinnamon or Carbidopa Levodopa as my first line of treatment. Um, but then also listening to the, to the concerns of the patients that if they have significant fatigue or there's a concern for a lot of nausea, vomiting, or the person has um, impulse control, this uh, impulse impulsivity problems already, or they may have some thinking difficulties or hallucinations. Then that would change which medication that I would I would recommend. Um, so this is something that again is is a bit of a it's it's more patient dependent. I would say. Okay, are there any um, things that you could do like with your diet? that might help um, prevent some of the uh, debilitating effects of Parkinson's or help even prevent from getting it? Mm -hmm. So I would, so I always recommend a heart healthy diet for everyone, a varied diet, but a diet that's going to be something where there's not a lot of processed sugars, where there are, are a range of vegetables and fruits, um, lean meats, uh, things of that nature, you know, whole, whole grains, those are important for my patients uh, along with exercise. Now, one thing with some of the medications, most of the medications, um, protein is, um, if you take a large, if you take your medication with a significant amount of protein, like some people take their medications with meals, um, the protein that, that's with that meal can inhibit the absorption of the levodopa, if, particularly if you're taking carbidopa, levodopa, or cinnamon. So I'm always very cautious with people who, for example, you know, the, the, the American breakfast of, you know, a bagel, um, eggs and bacon and some hash browns that has a significant amount of protein in it. Now, I don't want someone to not eat the things that they want to. However, I want them to be mindful of when they're taking their medications and when they're eating. So many of my patients, I say, OK, I don't want you to stop taking your protein because the protein is important because you can have muscle breakdown from moving so much. Or, or having to in, do more of an initiation of a movement like you would for our patients with resting tremor and rigidity and bradykinesia. Um, so you need that protein. However, the medications sometimes don't interact very well and aren't absorbed as well with protein in the stomach at the same time. So sometimes I recommend that people uh, take the medication 30 minutes before a meal um, or one hour after. Again, that gets a little dicey if you're taking the medications multiple times, like five times or upwards a day. Um, so for many of my patients, I say, you know what, I'd rather you take, take the medications than not take them, but just know that sometimes high amounts of protein can disrupt the absorption or the action of the, of the medication itself. Okay. And, I, and I think that's really helpful Please. too, just to tag in there at, um, at Fixel Institute, we have two mm -hmm. nutritionists that can make specific dietary recommendations and speak on different things that can that can be helpful and, and are doing studies that are looking into dietary changes in relation to Parkinson's symptoms oh, as well. Good. So um, again, part of that multidisciplinary team, whether it's at Fixel or other centers of excellence, I think that's something that's definitely being considered. Okay, great. Uh, last question. Have you heard of something called polypeptide therapy to help treat with Parkinson's? Yes, so I've heard of polypeptide therapy um, that they're trying to work on now. I, I it's not something that I um, often that, that that I've incorporated into my clinic currently. Um, I think the the uh, for me that the the jury is still out on that of whether or not how effective it is. Um, but it is something that is coming down the pipeline. Oh, okay, interesting. 
Well, I want to thank you guys both for taking the time out of your very busy schedules and making sure that we got this information today. I'd like to thank the audience for joining us as well. And um, like I said, keep an eye out for an email from me. I hope to have the the video link out by maybe Monday. Um, so I'll get working on that as quick as I can. And then we'll send out all, all the information that we kind of talked about um, and all the resources. But again, a lot of it you can find on the um, Fixcell Institute or ufhealth.org, but we'll get you there as well. So thank you so much for joining us today and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.